Welcome to the chess channel, the channel where you can learn loads. Today, we are going to cover our eighth game, and there is plenty to learn from. Chess is not an easy game and in order to get better, you would need to put in the practice and endless hours of study. If anything has become easier when it comes to the game, is that we have at least the software to aid us with our analysis and understanding. What we shall be looking today, is considered by many to have been the game of the century. It was the encounter between Donald Byrne and Bobby Fischer and was played back in 1956 for the third Rosenwald Trophy. For those who are paying attention to detail, there is a problem with the thumbnail used in this video. Can you spot it? It's the very photograph we used in it. Bobby Fischer looked nothing like the thumbnail but this is what Bobby Fischer looked like when the game was played. He was only 13 years old at the time. Soon after this game, the young Bobby Fischer rose to fame, and was seen to have all the qualities of a superstar. Now that we have the game particulars, let us bring up all the required details for those who wish to research further and let us get this game off the ground. Burn White set things off with one, knight f3, the Reti. This move has to be one of the most flexible openings on record. It allows the opposition to use a choice how to start. In short, this knight move to f3 can lead to basically any opening. Fischer 2, copied this response, Burn shot off with this pawn, and with Fischer opening up the diagonal, he also made his intentions crystal clear. Knight c3, led to the bishop to Fianchetto, Byrne here developed his pawn in the center, and with Bobby Fischer getting his king to safety, Byrne chooses to go for a London type of system. It an exact opposite to how Fischer would have played this opening. Fischer loved his bishops on c4 and this explains why Bobby hardly opened up with a move to c4 using the English. This bishop move on the king side aims to add the pressure on c7. Allow white to jump the knight into b5 and black is normally forced to bring the knight into a6 to cover. Fischke brought up this move and was very happy going up against the king's knight variation in the English. Queen b3 to stop the taking on c4, did not help. Fischer traded the pawn. And with burn capturing, he has now the attack he wanted on c7. How would you deal with this threat? Knight a6 as we mentioned before is playable but after this hypothetical thrust in the center, there is either c6 or even c5, and this attack on c7 is now neutralized. Another option to go for would be to bypass anything like c6, c5 and knight a6 and try possibly something like this attack. Should the pawn come off? If the queens come off, then you might be looking at something like this. After this knight finds his way to where he actually belongs, though black is a pawn down, he would have plenty of counterplay. White's position is particularly weak on c2. If you know go long, after the bishop is attacked, bishop f4 is going to run into this problem, and out of nowhere, white goes south. King b1 would run into this check, and if you try king a1, try this subsequent check, king back to b1 forced and here after this discovered check is produced, south is going to have to give up something. We saw nothing like this in this game. Fischer blocked the access with this move, Burn shoots off for the center, and this is how Fischer prepared. He developed the knight is now looking to attack the queen with knight b6. Rook d1, led to the queen to come under fire. Byrne got her to reposition here, and in turn, this is how Fischer tries to make progress. He pinned the knight, only to allow Byrne to cover with b2. This would be the most logical human move to apply and yet we never got to see it. Byrne 2 applied a brand new pin but there is a difference between these two last moves. Technically speaking, what you see here cannot be defined as pins. Fischer was looking to try and get this queen on c5 out of the way and in the end, he decided to go after here via this knight move. This has to be one crazy crazy move to consider but is it going to lead to anything? Let's check out what this knight move does. 1. He attacks the queen. 
2. The knight is additionally attacked and 3. There is this pawn on b2 hanging 2. From the three possible options to consider, there are basically only two to consider. Do you move the queen out of danger, or do you take the knight on a4? The third option to consider is also valid and that would be to bring the queen back to a3. This potential response would hold everything in check. Let us consider the implications of getting rid of the knight from a4. Do this and this is what is on the cards. Once you get rid of this central pawn, taking on the 7th would spell the end but for what side? The trade of queens would not be forced. Instead, come in with this check, and this knight now on a 4 is toast. A response such as b4 will lead to the knight to come off but this knight in the center of the board is most likely to fall next. However, the big problem here with white's position, rest with where the queen is standing. Rook e8 is met by this response, and before you are even looking to bring this bishop into f6, this is what you need first. Once this bishop is eliminated, if you capture with the pawn, after this bishop finds his way into f8, this would be it. Okay, this is one variation to look at which the game could have followed. Burns saw exactly what was coming so as soon as his queen come under fire, this is how he played it. Fisher having his knight attacked in two ways, the way to minimize any potential damage would be to either back him off to safety or go on and trade. Fisher did just this. When this knight was captured, this central pawn dropped and the game opens up significantly. With this new picture on the board, Byrne is down by a full pawn but with this pawn on e7 waiting to be taken, Byrne was trying to work out if it was safe to have him removed. For better or worse, he went for him. He took with the bishop and knew however, Bobby Fisher plays it, this rook on f8 would be history. If only chess was that simple. Fisher, as a matter of emergency had to move his queen out of danger but where could he put her? Queen d5 for example, will drop the rook but when this rook is captured, queen b3 to get the queens to come off looks like a smashingly great initiative. In addition to what we have here, this pawn on the queen side is attacked. Rook e8 and b2 is not going to cut it. Once the queens come off, take here on the third, and right after the rook is forced to come out of danger and cover, black would be down by the exchange but it would be south who is squeezed in and quite badly. Move of the day here would be one something easily missed by many. Can you see it? It's this bishop repositioning. Find a move like this and you're on top of the world. Knight e5 to try and close up the position will lead to his immediate attack. And if you back him off here, nothing but this blow here. King f1 is not going to do but why? Just take the bishop and when the rook goes it's not the initial pin on b4 that does all the magic but this brand new pin and if it was not game over before, it would be now. Bobby Fischer went for another line of play. He brought his queen to this outpost, and Byrne here does not remove the rook because when the bishop drops too, this subsequent attack on the queen may lead to something like this. Queen c1 is technically a blunder but can you see why? This is why. Just go on to get rid of this pawn and should you have this knight removed, this is what the idea is. Dropping the queen for something as silly as this, is going to cost you the game. If you alternatively try and get the queens to come off, the key move in this position would be to go for this rook repositioning. If the queens now go, bishop e2 falls short to this attack and right after the rook steps in to minimize the damage, we are back to our earlier variation. Bishop f5, knight e5, f6, knight c4 and bishop b4. and is game over exactly in the same way as we saw earlier. Let's see what happened right after Fisher repositioned his queen to safety. After some time calculating this new position, Byrne was looking at how to make ends meet. He definitely was looking at king safety and wanted most likely to castle. He was tossing between the idea of b2 and bc4. In the end, this is what he chose to play but Fisher even at this young age was unforgiving. Any ideas what he played once he figured out the situation and every single ramification in mind.
This is what he does and this has to be why Fisher had to be the master of this very game. There is no one on the planet who would not go on to get rid of this knight but does burn go for him. He had two and something clicked and leaves this knight standing. So what caught his eye and why does Byrne delay the taking of this knight? Well, if the knight is eliminated, after rook e8, queen e3 to save the bishop, runs instantly into this problem and this is how far this game comes. However you choose to play it, white gets busted. So just before the knight was considered to be removed, Byrne came up with this attack on the queen and adds plenty of spice on the chessboard. Any ideas on how Fisher made or tried to make progress? His queen is under fire, and the knight on c3 is hanging too. One something to consider would be to come in with this timely check and when the king is pushed to f1, queen c7 can be played. However, drop the knight in the meantime, and it would be Fisher trying to play catch up. So obviously, if you try this avenue of play, black would be done by quite a lot so if we just return to where we left things at. What on earth did young Bobby Fisher to and how did he try and remedy the situation? Okay, he first came in with a check. Byrne forces the king to f1 and by losing his castling rights, any idea how Fisher replies? What is about to follow, has to be not the move of the day but the move of the century, and this is probably the game was coined as the game of the century. It had to have a Bobby Fischer signature and this had to be the moment of truth. What move did Bobby Fischer execute and most importantly why? Let's look at some what ifs. If you try this knight move if both queens are traded, however, you choose to move on, both bishops on b6 and c4 are under fire. Since you can only save one, the logical conclusion would be to save one and surrender the other. One alternative would be to take with a check and when the king captures this bishop, now you can back off this bishop to c5 to attack the knight. The other way to do it would be to try this avenue of play. If you take and take, what you manage is at least to gain two pawns for the bishop but the end result is not bound to change. If you choose to get rid of the bishop from a6, this potential attack on the knight will lead to his retreat and this alternate line of play will take you south even faster. However, Fisher stood out from the crowd at this early age for what he was about to reveal, a move which astounded the entire world and everyone who was watching this game and as it was being played. This was that precious move and he bluntly invites the opposition to basically take his queen. Byrne could not believe his eyes. He looked at this position and once he calculated he could manage to beat Fisher who was going to be a full queen down, he does go on to take her down. An instant evaluation of what we have is that Fisher has no longer a queen on the board, but has he got enough compensation and how can he chip in? The rook is hanging, the bishop on a 6 is also hanging and of course this bishop on c4 is about to be taken with an instant check. So first things first, Fisher got rid of the bishop with an incoming check, Byrne here has no option but to force his king to g1 and if all goes pear-shaped for Fisher, he has at least a perpetual with knight e2. With e2 in full control, Fisher went for this check, and with the king coming back to where he was, Fisher goes on to get rid of this pawn from d4. This takes on the fourth automatically produces a discovered check which also means one thing. With the king yo-yoing another check was initiated. And with the king coming back to f1, the three pieces that make all the difference in what you see here are the bishop on c4, the knight on e2 and of course the rook on e8. What are we looking at next? It has to be a knight move but where? In short basically anywhere. For example if you come in with this knight check into g3, king g1, and if the rook is removed, taking the rook is going to be a disaster. Before you consider this knight, you may want to back off the bishop to safety. Once you accomplish this type of response, 
This knight is not going anywhere and white is back into the driver's seat. If we return to the game, even if you initiate this check from the third, King G1 can determine the outcome of the game if the rook is eliminated. In this instance, if you return the knight with the a check, King F1. And now not knight G3 but this knight moved to C3. Fischer did just this without the need to bring in a check from the third. So after the king was forced again into g1, even if the rook comes off, this would be still game over. If we put this knight back into c3, and let this rook be for just a second, Fischer first got rid of the bishop. And with the queen escaping to this outpost on b4, Fischer lifts the rook and goes after her. Byrne could not believe his eyes and how gaining a whole queen was backfiring in the way things went. When this poor pawn bit the dust, Fisher went on to get rid of this rook from the first, and if you look at what is happening on the board, given the kingside rook is yet to make his way into the game, we are looking at a knight and queen. In fact, this knight on f3 is additionally paralyzed. If he moves, there is an instant checkmate with the rook on the first and that would be it. With this in mind, Byrne opened up an escape path but when Fisher had another pawn removed from the game, Byrne knew how this one was going to end. King h2 led to yet another pawn to make a disappearing act. Rook e1 to challenge the rook had to be the last straw. Byrne was in a way hopeful Fisher would somehow mess up. If only this bishop on g7 was not here, we would have had an entirely different outcome. With what we see here, why didn't Byrne go on to get rid of the rook? This is of course in advance of what was played just to cover it. If you take, this incoming check forces the king right into g1, and a mate has to be lurking in the very background. Knight takes for example with a check and if you do go on to remove him, after this incoming check and king h1, this brand new check and knight g2, and is game over in a couple of moves. What's the fastest way to do this? Bishop g3, queen g1, and now you can leave everything standing. Just go for something like this, h4, and even this would do the job nicely. Take with a check and when the bishop drops, rook a1 will do superbly. Queen g1, hand over the queen to the rook, and at best you are looking at a mate in just about a handful of moves. Okay, when the rook on e1 came off, Byrne squeezed in this check but this bishop blockade was just enough to hand over the game to Fisher. It wasn't game over just yet but we are not far from it. When the rook went, this is how Fisher plays it. Not only he blocks the queen's access to the game but Fisher has all his pieces covered or nearly. The only unprotected something is here on b7 but Fisher would have a myriad of choices to cover him. After Byrne brought his knight into the third, he hoped Fisher would hand over his bishop to him. It wasn't to be, young Bobby Fisher jumped his knight into the fourth. Byrne here attacks this pawn, but via this thrust Byrne was close to resigning. h4, led to this push on the king side. Byrne repositions his knight right into the center of the board but with Fisher getting his king to find the seventh, Byrne chooses to go for a king march. Can anyone work out what his move actually does? Fisher with a king on g7 that is not faced with a check got his bishop to deliver this first class check. And as soon as the king found this outpost on f1, Fisher delivers this brand new check. King e1 led to this brand new check. The king is now forced west but how much longer can burn last? Much of what happens is down to the rook on a2 and of course the knight on g3 and the bishop pair that are basically dominating the entire board. When the checks continued in the way Fisher initiated them, the king was forced further west. And when this brand new check appeared, this had to be it. King b1 led to this brand new check and when Byrne bounced his king back to c1, Fisher had an option to checkmate not in one way but two. He went for this finish, 
but also this bishop check does the job as well and this is how Bobby Fischer only 13 years of age demonstrates what he was capable of taking down the one and only burn in just 41 moves. Everything really happened when Fischer chose to sacrifice his queen to opened up the game completely and in the way we saw him do his magic. Can we really say it was the game of the century? For many it was and this might just be good enough for the rest of us. There was something that caught my eye when the decision was made to cover this game in particular. All the sources you check for the exact date this game was played are given as 1956 but upon double checking if this game was in Bobby Fischer's most memorable games, this is what we come across. Indeed, this game is included in Bobby Fischer's book and this is the cover, but if you check the specifics and particulars of this game, please note Fischer himself, under game 48, he identifies this game dating back to the United States Championship between 1963 and 1964. Since this is his only mention about Bern, has there been an error somewhere and if so what is it? In order to illustrate, let's use the original source. What you see here, is the extract from page 297 and we can now confirm, this is not his brilliancy game of 1963 but a later game which Bobby Fischer does not even include in his 60 memorable games. How odd is this? His last entry refers to a game played in 1968. What Fischer himself said about his memorable games is right here in the preface of his book. For anyone who wants to read it, here it comes. Bobby thanks Larry Evans for all his work and to this date, it is still a mystery why Bobby Fischer did not consider this game to make it into his memorable 60. For sure our next edition will look at his brilliancy prize and is again won against Bern. In the meantime, we do hope you enjoy this game we experienced today. God bless and hope to see you soon.